Greetings and welcome, everyone. In light of the Valentine's Day holiday, I wanted to share some perspectives on relationships, specifically what goes into making a lasting marriage relationship. As my brother Tarek has been married for nearly 21 years now, I asked if he would be willing to share some of his thoughts. He requested that his wife be included as part of the discussion, and I was only too happy to oblige. May I present my sister-in-law and Tarek's wife, Kimberly. Hi, everyone. Tarek and Kimberly have compiled some of their thoughts and observations on how to build an enduring marriage relationship. I hope their discussion is helpful to those who are either in a marriage relationship or considering one. I'm going to step out and allow them to discuss. Now please, you two, don't mess up my office. Thanks, Doc. No worries. Okay, okay. Now, where did he hide the cookies? Hey, now. Not yet. This is a serious discussion. But, 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 cookies! Oh, all right. Serious discussion. Several concerns came up from those who are considering marriage. First, that marriage is a huge life change. You're concerned it will force you to abandon a lot of the life and the interests that you had when you were single. Second, that more and more marriages in today's world are failing and end in divorce. And third, that many folks simply don't feel prepared for marriage. They fear they won't be able to understand what needs to go into a healthy, long-term relationship. These are valid concerns. Let me say that, yes, marriage is a huge life change but it's not the sort of change that forces you to leave your identity behind. Most single people have friends and family, and these relationships often take somewhat of a high priority in their lives. However, many singles also put their own individual needs and wants at a high priority. Survival, food, shelter, clothing, emotional stability are all very valid individual needs that people strive to fulfill. When you get married... Those individual needs suddenly become the needs of two people. When children come into the relationship, those needs increase even more. While your individual needs, of course, still should be met, your consideration for those needs now extend to multiple people instead of just your own. It requires a greater sense of maturity and responsibility, of looking outward toward others instead of more inward to your own needs and desires. Everyone has life goals, plans for the future. These include career choices, finances, life aspirations, and may include children and even religion. These are big life priorities based on your own core principles and motivations. These are the things that are very important and dear to your heart. When you get married, there are suddenly two people working toward those life goals. And it's possible, and even probable, that one spouse's goals may not be the same as the other. We talked about this before we got married. Yep, we did. A lot. It was important that we knew about each other's life priorities to make sure that they were compatible, so that we could build our marriage around fulfilling those goals. I wanted to finish my college degrees. And I made sure that happened. I certified as an elementary school teacher. I also wanted to use those skills in the home as a mother. For us personally, we decided before marriage that Tarek would be the primary breadwinner and that the finances would be shared as a family. I knew that I wanted to be a father too. It's a good thing Kimberly wanted to have children. You see? Goal alignment before marriage. Even though these life goals seem to be pretty common, I assure you that there are a lot of people who have different long-term priorities. It is critical that you discuss these things before marriage. And for those of you who are already married, you may have discovered after the fact that you and your spouse have some different goals. Don't panic. This doesn't mean you're not compatible. It just means that communication and positive negotiation is even more important for your relationship. Even with in-depth discussions before marriage, Tarek and I learned that more goal alignment and adjustments needed to happen along the way. 21 years later, we still revisit and adjust our relationship to find what works for us together. Communication is a critical part of any long-lasting marriage. And good communication requires two things. First, total honesty. 
And second, being unselfish. Early in our relationship, and before we were married, I impulsively asked Tarek the age-old question. Penny, for your thoughts? I didn't expect it to become something deep and meaningful. I was actually being a bit playful. But his answer to that question was a window into his soul as well as some of the conflict he was going through at the time. It wasn't mean, but it was somewhat painful. It was totally honest, and that honesty became a cornerstone of our relationship. Since then, we've used that same penny for your thoughts phrase as a code signal that we are ready and open to hear honest thoughts from our spouse, even if that honesty might be painful. On the flip side, the sharer never uses the opportunity to tear down the asker. Their honesty is given without digs nor barbs. This leads to the unselfish part of communication in a marriage. If you are truly honest and open with each other, you are also leaving yourself vulnerable to your spouse. This vulnerability is very healthy in a good relationship. It allows you to let your guard down and to have a soft place to land, as it were, when you're feeling sad, frustrated, lonely, etc. But that vulnerability can be exploited very easily. This is why unselfish communication must be the rule. Never, never abuse a vulnerable confidence that has been shared with you. Never use it against your spouse as fuel in a fight, nor as gossip to someone else. Conflict is part of marriage. A wise man and woman once defined conflict as growth waiting to happen. When you're honestly communicating with each other, it's a time where conflict, concerns, and frustrations can and should be discussed. But these need to be discussed fairly and objectively. Allow your spouse to voice concern without interruption. Give real consideration to the validity of their feelings, <laughs> even if you disagree with them. Take time to tell them how you can see that their concerns make sense, given their point of view. As Stephen Covey teaches, seek first to understand. And when it's your turn to express your feelings, remember that how you say it is just as important as what you say. Here are two examples of sharing a concern. See how the words are exactly the same, but the two meanings are very, very different. Imagine a situation where a pet has made a mess on the carpet and you're asking your spouse for help to clean it up. Tarek, the dog threw up on the carpet. Again, can you help me please? The meaning in those words is very different in the next example. Tarek, the dog threw up on the carpet again. Uh, can you help me, please? I agree. This is not a very deep example, but I think it makes a good point. In the first example, the listener's natural reaction is to put up the shields, hunker down, and get ready to defend themselves in a fight. The listener in the second example is much less likely to feel judged or threatened. While the importance of your tone of communication may seem obvious, it is pretty common in all of us to assume that our own tone is just fine, while assuming that the other's tone is not. Don't make these assumptions. It is much more important to be conscious of your own tone when you speak than to judge the tone of your spouse. Be quick to assume that your spouse is not judging or threatening, and you will be amazed at how often you're right. Marriage relationships grow through conflict, resolution, and coming to a greater level of understanding. When conflict arises, always ask the question, how are we going to work through this? And never ask the question, is this really worth it? Except in cases of deliberate abuse, asking yourself if a marriage is worth it is nearly always a losing battle. If you look for them, there are always things that you can find wrong with any relationship. Realize that if your spouse only looked for the negative in you, it wouldn't be long before they couldn't see anything positive about you. But if they only looked for the positive in you, then your flaws, weaknesses, annoying quirks would be like background noise to your great character. We joke about the adage that marriage is 80-20. Spouses like 80% but dislike the other 20% of each other. But our joke is to act arrogant and say, oh, but our marriage is 90-10. However, we follow it up with saying, 
but oh, that 10%. Remember that when you disagree, disagree fairly. Discuss calmly and allow your spouse to express feelings without interrupting nor judging. Stick to the topic at hand. No name-calling, no character attacks. Also, allow your spouse to retreat with dignity. Don't paint them into a painful corner with accusations. Now, moving on to the useless rule that marriage is a 50-50 balance. You mean the awesome 100-100 rule? Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I'm afraid we're running out of time for this video. Aw, uh, so no cookies? But we're just getting started. Oh yes, I agree. Which is why I think we need to continue this discussion. But that will have to be in a later video, so I'm going to have to ask you to stay around to continue working on this project. Ah, so we still get cookies. Oh, hush you. Besides, I already snatched some. So while we get back to work, we'd be interested to hear your thoughts on lasting marriage relationships. Do you have any advice that you feel would add to this discussion? Any of you who feel you have a successful relationship who could share some of your success stories? Or perhaps you feel that your marriage could be better? What would you like to see change? Please leave your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, I am Dr. Wolf. I'm Kimberly. And I'm Tarek Dragon. And we look forward to hearing from you.